Hey, this is Miss Ruggieri from the best library in town, Robinson Intermediate School. And I want to start my KFC back up. I know it's a kind of a vacation from it for a while, but I've been rethinking about it. And um, I want to start it back up again because it's a great way for you guys to hear some great stories from the library and maybe get you hooked and interested in wanting to check out a new book, a new read. So I thought I'd start with a classic. This is uh, called Moby Dick. And this book was actually written in 1851. This is a different version of it, kind of like all my Legend of Sleepy Hollows. I have different versions of it, even though it was written over, I think, 200 years ago. Uh, so this is a different version, but it was actually the first time it was ever written and published was in 1851 by Herman Melville. And he's a very old looking dude. And if you want to know anything about him, uh, you can use our database uh, at uh, uh, Britannica, my fave, my very fave, my favorite one, and find out uh, some information about him. But anyway, Moby Dick. And so I'm going to read the first chapter. Um, so this is really cool. And the thing I've liked reading about this book is it's an easy read. Not meaning that the words are super simple. It just means that it flows really well. It's not like you're stumbling over the words or you're trying to sound them out because you haven't gotten to that kind of reading yet. So it's, it's really a nice, easy, uh, relaxing type read. So the first chapter is called The Spouter N, I-N-N. -N. Call me Ishmael. By training, I am a country schoolmaster. That means he's a teacher. But my heart often longs for waves and water. Yeah, whenever I find myself growing gloomy and short-tempered, I must take to the sea. I ship as a sailor. Being ordered about takes some getting used to, but I do it. They pay me, and I like much to be paid. Though I had always sailed on merchant ships, I decided to sign on a whaler for a new adventure. So I stuffed a shirt or two into my carpet bag and headed for Massachusetts. I arrived in New Bedford on a Saturday night, too late to catch the ferry to Nantucket. I wanted a cheap place to stay, to stay, and I knew the cheapest lodging would lie in the deepest gloom. Blocks of blackness lined the streets. Once or twice, I saw a candle move through the night like a ghost in a tomb. Finally, I came to a crooked building where a sign swung on rusty chains. It read, The Spouter Inn, Peter Coffin. Just turn it down. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Sorry, I had my timer uh, going off. Lodging with a man named Coffin must surely be cheap, I thought. I entered the public room and looked around. Wailing lances and harpoons hung on the smoke-stained wall. On the far side, the bar was made from the arched bone of a whale's jaw. I told the landlord I wanted a room, and he said that they were full. But, he added, if you don't mind sharing, there's room to bunk in with a harpooner staying here. Since I had no desire to wander in the cold night, I agreed. I ate my meal with other shivering boarders in a room with no fire. We lingered over our scalding tea, warming our frozen fingers on the mug. Landlord, I said as the man passed, which one is the harpooner? Oh, none of these, he said, grinning. The harpooner is a dark chap, and he eats nothing but rare steak. Groups of rowdy seamen came and went, but the harpooner, among them. Finally, I called to the landlord, what sort of chap keeps such late hours as this harpooner? He's not normally so late, the landlord said. It must be that he couldn't sell his head. Do you mean to say that this harpooner is actually out peddling his head around town? The landlord nodded. I told him not to. The market's flooded. At this, I lost my temper. I come to your house and I want a bed. 
You tell me you'll give me half a bed, but a harpooner fills the other half, and now he's out selling his head? Do you think I would sleep with a madman or give money to a trickster? Be easy, the landlord said calmly. The harpooner just returned from the South Sea. He brought up a lot of shrunken heads from New Zealand. Why had he not spoken plainly before? The landlord just chuckled. The harpooner's never been this late. He must have found other lodgings. Let me show you to your bed. I followed him to another freezing room with a huge bed. The landlord placed his candle on the old sea chest that served as a table. Then he bid me good night and left. A tall harpoon leaned against one wall with a seaman's bag close by. I wasted no more time looking around and tumbled into bed. I had drifted into a light sleep when I heard heavy footsteps in the passage. A glimmer of light came from under the door. The harpooner. I lay perfectly still. The stranger came into the room with a candle in one hand and a shrunken head in the other. And here's what he looks like. I had just begun to breathe again when the man pulled off his hat. He was bald with only a small knot of hair twisted up on his forehead. The skin of his bald head glowed purplish. Finally, he turned to face me in the glow of the candle. I thought for a moment that the man had been badly beaten because his face was so marked up. But then I realized the marks were only tattoos. If he had not been standing between me and the door, I would have had to run. I considered climbing out the window as the harpooner undressed for bed. Suddenly, he lurched toward the bed with his tomahawk, tomahawk, oh, sorry, tomahawk in his hand. Speak, he demanded. Are you a devil here to kill me in the night? I will kill you first. Help! I shrieked, landlord, save me! Who are you? The harpooner demanded again, waving the tomahawk around. At that moment, the landlord burst into the room. I scrambled from the bed and ran to him. Don't be afraid, the landlord said. Queequeg here wouldn't hurt you. Look at him, I shouted. He threatened me with his tomahawk. What if he made those shrunken heads and wanted mine next? This brought a roar of laughter from the landlord. That's a pipe, he said. Queequeg likes a bit of smoke before he goes to bed. That's all. He turned to Queequeg. He's rented half the bed, you understand? You came in late for me to warn you. I understand, Queequeg said, and I straightened up. Well, tell him to stash his tomahawk or pipe or whatever that is. I don't want a man smoking in bed with me. Queequeg agreed. I bade the landlord good night, climbed in the bed, and tumbled into a restful sleep. Okay, so I bet you guys are wondering about where this is going. And on the cover, I know I saw a whale and a ship, and I see Queequeg. I already see him on the cover, and there looks like there's a huge storm, and the whale does not look happy. So I'm going, okay, where's this whale coming into this story? Where's the ocean? Where's the, the boat? So I was looking through some of the chapters, and I found kind of where they start to meet this uh, whale. It's chapter 8, uh, and so they start to meet. Uh, he goes on a whaling ship, and they uh, spot the whale. Uh, from the ship, and um, Queequeg throws a harpoon at the whale and misses him, but the whale comes so close to the ship that it almost knocks the ship over. So I'm thinking chapter eight is where this action with the whale is really going to start get, getting uh, going really quickly. But you know, I was thinking about this cover and um, sometimes when you're reading um, you just start thinking about other things and so this is what KFC is turning into for me the cool first chapter Friday is it's got me thinking about not about chicken but about other books and I'm looking at this cover going ooh 
I wonder what it was like to be a whaler and live on a whaling ship for some time in your life if that was your job. So I went looking around the library and I found this really good series that we have. It's called the You Wouldn't Want To series. We've got a whole bunch of them. And I found this one uh, called You Wouldn't Want To Sail on a 19th Century Whaling Ship. And I started looking through this book, and the first page talks about Nantucket. Now, Nantucket was where this teacher uh, was thinking about uh, going because um, he was going to uh, go on a ship, a whaling ship. And so he had made it to Massachusetts, but it was too late to get the ship to go to Nantucket. Well, and then I looked at this, and I'm going, Nantucket? Whaling capital of the world. Oh my goodness, I didn't know that. And it's off the coast of uh, Massachusetts. It says Nantucket is a small island located in the North Atlantic, about 25 miles south of Cape Cod. And in 1819, it's the whaling capital of the world with over 70 ships. Oh my goodness. And this book goes on to talk about. Um, that life back then, being a whaler and on a whaling ship, and diagrams of what they looked like and their voyages, uh, and where here's Nantucket right here, and which way those whaling ships were going. Look at that, they're traveling all around South America. And can you imagine all the beautiful ocean that they got to see while they were on this whaling ship looking for whales? And then I started thinking, oh, my gosh, after looking at this book, I'm thinking about all the kinds of uh, life in our oceans. And so I found this great book that we have, and I looked at the uh, index at the back of the book, and I was looking for sperm whales because I know in this book, I believe it is a sperm whale that is um, – one of the main characters of this story. And so, yes, there is a picture of a real sperm whale on page 10. And look at that. Aren't they beautiful whales? Look at that. And then I was thinking, okay, well, how do they get these pictures of these blue whales? You know, there's probably a photographer down there, an underwater photographer. So that started me to think about oceanographers and explorers and so again I went to the index and on page 258 there is a lady in this book that's talking about how it is to be an oceanographer and it said that she was inspired by a very famous oceanographer explorer uh, Jacques Cousteau yeah I have heard a lot about him he is very famous for creating uh, underwater uh, experiences and exploring and coming up with um, equipment to picture and film and uh, look at things under the water, under the ocean. And so we have a biography book on Jacques Cousteau, and it's really neat and colorful the way it's written, but he wanted to stay underwater longer, so he... Uh, started trying to invent new uh, gear, like scuba gear and underwater gear to stay into the ocean even longer and be able to move freely without being tied to a, an air hose. And so then that started me thinking about all kinds of equipment that explorers must use. And so I found this eyewitness book. And, of course, I went to the index, couldn't find what I was looking for, but I looked at the chapters, and so I was looking for underwater exploration and life at sea, starts on page 28, and so, yes, on page 28, here are some uh, exploration equipment that people who explore the ocean do use. And some of this stuff looks really, really old. And then I was thinking about Jacques Cousteau, and here he is. And it talks some more about some of the things that he invented and submarines to go deep down and explore the ocean. And then all of this got me to think about Shackleton. I don't know if you've been listening to the news lately, but Shackleton's shipwreck off of the um, coast of Antarctica, they have found it. 
And so I was watching it a little bit on the History Channel last night, and I saw half of it. I'm up to the part where they sent these um, probes down, and they're going to show us them finding Shackleton's shipwreck. It's one of the most famous shipwrecks next to the Titanic uh, off the coast of Antarctica. And it's amazing. And, you know, those people, uh, you need to Britannica that, research that too, because that's an amazing, um, huge human feat that happened. And they survived this uh, voyage. It's very terrible. Their ship sank. They were in the ice. And the men uh, walked across uh, Antarctica and they basically saved themselves. And, and it's just a neat Neat historical event. You need to read all about it. Anyway, and it's also on the History Channel. Uh, so anyway, isn't that amazing how all these things and how your mind can work and come piece things together and explore things all from reading just one book? These books will be at our KFC display. Come in.